the again uh, kind of one of my favorite topics because i have worked closely on this uh, eor uh, while being in kane and also now in malaysia so uh, i will be presenting a few case studies what we did how we did uh, obviously it's a very vast topic so one one and a half hours may not be uh, sufficient to cover uh, all the aspects related to eor but still i will try to capture as much i as i can and again uh, i am not uh, i am not a professor or a, <laughs> or a lecturer or assistant professor who will give you all the basics and all the theory behind it but yes i am open to having those discussions but uh, what i will be presenting you is the uh, uh, thinking or the uh, how how the industry proceeds with any eor project so uh, you can say it will be all about practical uh, approach uh, towards eor projects and in its implementation so having said that i will start my presentation with a small uh, brief although niladri has covered uh, my uh, biography i would say my uh, background but still i would like to uh, cover it uh, very briefly so i did my uh, btech uh, from ism in 2002 and then did my msc from heriot watt in 2011 and uh, as as niladri explained uh, i have been fortunate enough to work in various shore and offshore environment across uh, india africa and malaysia now and um, uh, most of my work has been as a reservoir engineer uh, regarding ftp and uh, execution of ftp and uh, specialty wise Uh, i have been again uh, fortunate enough to work in most one of the most challenging fields uh, which is heavy and viscous oil field in rajasthan which is called mangla and ashwarya and then also tight and uh, tight oil and tight gas development projects and then satellite and marginal field development uh, again uh, in terms of well reservoir and facility management and production optimization it's a very open topic uh, nothing very particular about it but it's a day to day challenge which any reservoir engineer will have to go through when he joins the industry and in terms of my uh, particular experience with respect to uh, today's topic which is eor uh, i have been part of uh, water flood uh, management planning execution and uh, its implementation uh, in in mangla and then uh, polymer flood design execution and fulfilled implementation and also briefly i was part of asp pilot design and execution and we had a small field a uh, very heavy and viscous field where we also implemented one thermal eor technology called cyclic steam stimulation i will briefly touch upon that if we get uh, sufficient time and then in malaysia again i am working on a very unique eor project which is called gas vac Uh, gravity assisted simultaneous water and gas injection so we will also talk about it uh, so and then uh, obviously as a reservoir engineer uh, i have been again fortunate enough to work uh, on various types of simulation uh, studies be it black oil compositional or streamline and all the classical reservoir analysis uh, including surveillance and monitoring uh as a reservoir engineer you will also get a chance to work on uh, reserves reporting which is which is part of a uh, regulatory uh, reporting exercise for any company or, or any any part of the world so you will be associated with that and uh, yes and uh, last but not least i have been again associated with a uh, few few technical papers uh, close to 20 technical papers excuse been, me sir yes so you are you changing your slides because yes now uh, changed okay so do i need to uh, get out of the slide so mode i'm not sure i suppose yes so okay then we will keep it this way is it visible yes this way okay yes. so i will make it bigger okay so uh, can you see it so yes. it's the myself slide Right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. And so, uh, having said that, then uh, uh, in terms of my career progression, I started off with ONGC, worked there for three years, then joined a small company at that time called Kane Energy, uh, which was a UK-based company. Uh, and they just started few years back, so we, uh, I joined at in two thousand five, 
uh, in 2014 that company was acquired by Vedanta Group uh, and then I moved on to join a Nigerian company called Sipco and then last year I joined Petronas. So this is how my career has been progress, uh, progressing so far. So uh, we move to today's uh, discussion which is uh, EOR. So this is how I have uh, uh, tried to uh, uh, arrange my slides. So the basic contents, basically I will briefly touch upon uh, today's uh, hydrocarbon resources, uh, how, how the scenario looks like. And then we get into our uh, main topic, which is uh, EOR. I have also tried to capture one slide on IOR because people do get confused uh, between IOR and EOR. So that's why I've tried to uh, keep it uh, one slide for that. And then we talk in terms of uh, what are the screening criteria for any EOR method in any, any, any reservoir and how do we select. And then we basically talk about three types of EOR. One is called gas, chemical and thermal. And then um, we will share uh, some case studies followed by uh, some questions, uh, Q&A session if, if we have time. Okay. So first, uh, basically, I would like to share uh, the current scenario. Uh, data is maybe one, one and a half years old data, but it's still very relevant. Uh, so I don't know how to zoom it without getting into slides. So uh, can you all uh, uh, see it clearly? these small charts no sir no sir so uh so you can zoom it from bottom yes okay So I will start from left. So uh, this triangle, uh, what it says is uh, conventional reservoirs, basically uh, what we read in literature and during our BTEC courses is nothing but conventional reservoirs and how do we develop those reservoirs. But they, they actually uh, are uh, consumed just maybe 30 to 40% of total hydrocarbon uh, resources worldwide. So at the top of this pyramid, you, what you see is the conventional reservoirs, uh, which is high medium quality reservoirs, very easy to develop, uh, low cost. And uh, uh, I mean, uh, it's, it's purely natural depletion or some, some uh, IOR or maybe uh, initial EOR, uh, you can say. So this is at the top of the pyramid. And then you, as you progress, you have more and more to exploit uh, requires massive hydraulic uh, mostly in uh, you will see uh, uh, how, uh, I mean uh, although we don't have any slides but we can talk about it again if time permits so these are different kinds of conventional and unconventional reservoirs that that, that the industry is dealing with uh, in terms of uh, uh, securing the energy supply uh, for the community for the country and for the world so in terms of, uh, if you see, uh, in terms of uh, reason by his breakup, most of the uh, oil resources, they lie in Middle East, which, which consumes close to 55 to 60%, and then followed by North America, and then uh, Central and South Africa, uh, America and uh, Africa. And Asia only consumes just 3% of uh, total oil uh, resources, which is available worldwide. In terms of different types of reservoirs, which we just uh, saw in this pyramid, the conventional oil constitutes just 30%, and remaining 70% are basically difficult or challenging reservoirs, like a heavy oil or extra heavy oil, or another kind is called bitumen, uh, which is nothing but uh, tar, tar sand, if you understand, uh, which requires uh, basically oil mining. So 
surface mining and you produce it. Similarly, in terms of gas, if you see uh, the portion of gas uh, uh, reserves or resources, they, they started contributing more and more towards energy supply. And the oil, reserve, uh, oil resources, if you see, that kept on decreasing these blue bar charts that you see. And the gas reserves, this is again the extrapolation or forecast in 2025 and 2030 that your gas will uh, constitute more than 50% of total energy supply and oil will only uh, contribute around 30 to 40% of oil supply, uh, sorry, energy supply. In terms of gas reserves, you can see uh, how with time, this is 1995, 2005, and this is 2015, again, uh, different parts of the world, how the contribution or how the uh, percentage of uh, world's gas reserves has grown because new and new discoveries are mostly gas and industry has also started focusing mostly on gas uh, development uh, in the last few years. So you can see uh, Middle East again constitutes almost close to half, uh, close to 43% and then followed by 30% uh, uh, in Europe and Eurasia. And different parts of the world so the basic message that i was trying to convey is basically what we have today is easy oil uh, what the industry has been producing for maybe hundreds of years and uh, they are declining declining now very fast and uh, industry is now moving towards alternate uh, uh, sources to to uh, supplement this declining reserves and by 2030 uh, additional reserves needed to offset not only decline in existing fields, but also to meet the increasing demand because demand is also increasing day, uh, uh, day by day uh, with the increase in population, obviously. And then and that is why the conventional way of uh, developing these reservoirs uh, require more and more depend dependence on uh, these uh, technologies like IOR or EOR or any alternate resources which can which can secure your energy supply so uh, i am sure uh, you would all have uh, studied in your uh, petroleum engineering courses the stages of field development which starts from exploration then followed by appraisal development and then you go into production and what you see in this uh, this graph is the cash flow so during exploration and appraisal company spends most of the money and then you get into development when the actual production comes in and that, that is when the cash flow for the company starts in and that is why where the role of reservoir engineers comes into play in terms of optimizing your uh, uh, production and wells and reservoir and facilities so that's uh, and by implementation of right technology you maximize your recovery so on the plot on the right you can see that uh, this is where there is no production during exploration and appraisal. And once you get into development, first initially, I mean, theoretically, you start with a natural depletion scenario. And then once you have enough data and you have understanding of the reservoir drive mechanism, you start implementing some IOR, some pressure maintenance. That's when your uh, some incremental oil comes in. And at the late end of the field life, you start implementing EOR. And that's when you uh, basically recover most of, I mean, the, uh, the remaining potential of the reserves. And then you get into abandonment and decommissioning. But uh, uh, having said that, uh, uh, in my experience, uh, the EOR doesn't need to wait till this point. We can start the EOR as early as possible to maximize this gain. So we can uh, discuss about it uh, later on. So basically, again, uh, what are the challenges that you face? Uh, because you must have uh, read in the uh, um, books or literatures that uh, recovery factor of most of the fields are in the range of 40 to 50 percent, right? So what is the reason why we can only recover 40 to 50 percent and why not 100 percent? So there comes the role of uh, various factors and one of them is called reservoir drive mechanism uh, like i mean i'm sure again you would have read uh, the different types of drive mechanism like 
डिजोल्व गैस और सोल्यूशन गैस वाटर ड्राइव गैस कैप ड्राइव और कॉम्बिनेशन ड्राइव दीज आर वेरियस टाइप्स ऑफ ड्राइव मैकेनिज्म दैट यू विल एक्सपीरियंस इन 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 एनी फील्ड एंड डिपेंडिंग ऑन दैट टाइप ऑफ ड्राइव मैकेनिज्म आई मीन यू विल हैव डिफरेंट टाइप्स ऑफ प्रेशर डिप्लीशन एंड रिकवरी रिकवरी एफिशेंसी सो वट वट दिस ग्राफ सेज इज द मैक्सिमम यू कैन सी दिस प्लॉट ऑन वाई एक्सिस इज बेसिकली परसेंटेज ऑफ ऑरिजिनल रिजर्व ऑफ प्रेशर सो दिस इज नथिंग बट यू स्टार्ट विथ इनिशियल प्रेशर एंड दिस इज हाउ द प्रेशर इन डिक्रीज ओवर अ पीरियड ऑफ टाइम एंड अगेंस्ट दिस डिक्रीज इन रिजर्व ऑफ प्रेशर दिस दिस इज योर रिकवरी फैक्टर सो वट इट सेज इज number 5 is your gravity drainage i am i am not very sure how many of you have read uh, all of this but based on the uh, industry experience and various literature and articles you will go through in one petro you will find that the best recovery that we get is in gravity drainage uh, uh, sorry uh, my mistake what water uh, water uh, water drive followed by gravity drainage and then uh, gas cap solution gas and the least recovery is in compaction drive or liquid rock expansion drive so these are the recovery factor ranges for various various uh, drive mechanism uh, another factor that goes into this recovery factor is your uh, volumetric sweep efficiency so what is volumetric sweep efficiency it has got three factors basically one is called aerial sweep efficiency second is called vertical sweep efficiency and third is called microscopic sweep efficiency so these three the product of these three uh, sweep efficiencies is nothing but your uh, recovery uh, recovery factor of the field which you see on the graph and these three factors basically dependent on various factors like reservoir heterogeneity reservoir compartmentalization how your vertical heterogeneity is how your aerial heterogeneity is mobility ratio uh, residual saturation initial water saturation etc so uh, i mean uh, we uh, obviously uh, with the limited time we have we cannot get into too much details but i am sure during your btech you will uh, go through uh, in detail about these 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 uh, various uh, sweep efficiencies and the factors affecting it so the challenges in terms of achieving higher recovery what are the various challenges that we uh, see or experience so as i said majority of the fields today which are producing are in mature stage and uh, they are declining as as we know and uh, this this factor called reserves replacement ratio what does uh, what is this so basically any company or any field uh then uh, how much reserves we have in the reservoir against which how much i have produced and how much i have uh, added new reserves so the ratio of total production and total reserves that we have added in 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 the last year that will give you a product called reserves replacement ratio as long as reserves replacement ratio is equal to or more than 1 uh, you can say that Uh, we are doing a good job and uh, there is no reserves depletion but most of the cases uh, today's reality is reserves replacement ratio is much lower than one for most of the fields today in 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 the world and that's why uh, you are depleting your reserves every day and again you might be following uh, various news and articles where you would see i mean we ne- uh, we did not had any major discoveries in the recent past and uh, wherever we have the discoveries they are either uh, deep ocean which require heavy capital investment and rate of returns are very low or very uh, challenging uh, reservoirs which are difficult to produce so that's why uh, i mean we the industry is going through a very uh, i would say volatile market scenario uh, we have less easy oil to develop and more difficult oil to uh, extract due to rising project cost and on top of that various governments agencies and regulatory bodies they have imposed lots of stringent environmental compliances so which which again needs lots of capital investment for any company uh, to 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 abide by that in order to do any kind of development projects so these are all 
I mean, some of the factors which are uh, leading to uh, recovery efficiency challenges. So, I mean, uh, obviously, we are not going to solve these challenges today, but uh, I just wanted uh, all of you to uh, to understand the challenges that company and uh, the industry is going through. So, having said that, we now come into the main uh, discussion, uh, which which I would like to uh, focus. So, basically, before we get into uh, EOR or IOR. I'm sure you would have heard that there are various types of displacement forces within reservoir. So what are these uh, various forces? So there are basically three major uh, displacement forces which, which uh, contribute to any kind of recovery, which is called capillary, viscous, and gravitational force. And then uh, on top of that, how your fluid-fluid uh, interaction, when I say fluid-fluid interaction means let's say when you are doing some kind of injection or some kind of EOR. So obviously you inject some fluid and then you have another fluid in the reservoir, which is your oil basically or gas. So how this injected fluid and displaced fluid, they interact with each other. And then there is something called rock fluid interaction, which means the reservoir rock, how it uh, interacts with the reservoir fluid as well as with the injected fluid. So these two things, rock fluid and fluid fluid interaction, they basically govern um, various properties like wettability, interfacial tension, capillary pressure, and relative permeability. And these parameters will again uh, affect your recovery during various displacement forces or various displacement processes like IOR or EOR. Okay. So uh, again, before uh, there are these are some few terminology uh, which you all should be knowing before you analyze any EOR projects. So maybe I will skip this, but yes, you can go through it uh, in your literature. Uh, capillary number, bond number, and gravity number. These are very important parameters which are basically dependent on fluid properties, interfacial tension, and your injected fluid uh, velocity. So based on these uh, uh, ranges, you decide on various types of displacement processes and also whether the displacement will be stable or not. So these are some of the important parameters which needs to be uh, monitored and understood well. Then another parameter that needs to be understood well is mobility ratio. This is one of the most critical item. And how do you define this mobility ratio? First, uh, let us look at the definition of mobility. Mobility is nothing but your ratio of permeability over viscosity. So it could be mobility of like in this case, Kw by mu w means viscous permeability, effective permeability with uh, to water divided by viscosity of injected water. That is the mobility of water. If I replace W with O, it will be mobility of oil. So uh, with this, you can now define mobility ratio, which is nothing but mobility of displacing fluid. Like if you are doing water injection, displacing fluid will be water and mobility of displaced fluid, which is nothing but oil. So you can, uh, with the definition uh, uh, given here, you can define mobility ratio by K by mu of water by K by mu of oil. And as long as this mobility ratio is equal to or less than one. We can say that the displacement or any EOR that you implement will have a higher recovery. But the moment we get into mobility ratio more than one, we get into an unstable displacement reason. And that's where you have, uh, uh, again, if you are aware about the terminology is called uh, fingering, uh, water fingering through reservoirs or so, uh, this is basically when your reservoir oil viscosity is much higher than the viscosity of your injected fluid. That is when this fingering phenomena happens and it happens. And that's where you will see mobility ratio of more than one. And another uh, parameter, uh, which is endpoint mobility ratio, uh, which is defined based on your initial uh, water saturation and uh, residual oil saturation. So how do you uh, mobilize the trapped phase? So when we talk about EOR, 
you are talking about a phase when i say phase means it's the oil which is which is uh, bypassed or is still remaining in reservoir and cannot be produced uh, with natural uh, energy that it has right so that is where uh, the role of ur comes in so how do you mobilize this trapped phase so one method is as i said this capillary number is very important term so if you go by the definition of a capillary number capillary number is defined by uh, viscosity of displacing fluid which is water and interfacial tension between oil and water and this is v is nothing but the velocity of injected water so this is a graph if which is called capillary desaturation curve so on y axis you have residual and saturation and on the x axis you have capillary number which is this parameter so it says that higher the capillary number lower is your residual oil saturation so when uh, and lower is the residual oil saturation it will result in higher and higher oil recovery so that is why when we go for any eor implementation the objective of any particular eor project is to increase your capillary number and you can increase it look at the formula and if you can answer this question how do you increase this capillary number either you increase the velocity or you increase the viscosity injected water or you reduce this parameter called interfacial tension these are the three ways and when we talk about chemical you are like asp what they do is they reduce the interfacial tension and hence increase the capillary number and resulting in residual uh, re reduction in your residual oil saturation which results in ultimately in higher oil recovery second method is improve phase behavior between oil and displacing fluid so what uh, do i mean by that so basically like for example when you inject gas uh, it it swells the oil okay and what it results in viscosity oil viscosity reduction and uh, uh, condensing gas drive miscibility okay uh, maybe uh, i am not sure if you guys are aware about this terminology but i will try to capture it in detail when we go into subsequent slides what i mean by that but but in a simplistic term what i can tell you is when we go for any gas ur method like injecting uh, any gas or co2 or anything into oil reservoir what it does is it reduces the viscosity of oil it also reduces uh, and once it achieves miscibility uh, the interfacial tension is gone so uh, there is no concept of any residual oil saturation and hence uh, you can uh, maximize your oil recovery so in summary to improve recovery from oil reservoir what you can do you can either go for any water injection project which will reduce your sor to sorw then you go for any gas injection project which will reduce sorw to sorg and then you can go for chemical injection like surfactant which will reduce sorw to sorc which is the minimum residual oil saturation that you can achieve and hence you can get maximum oil recovery i hope till this point uh, it's okay or you can uh, ask if you have any questions or shall i proceed okay okay so i proceed then to the next slide so uh, okay so i will just give you a brief flavor of uh, various ior and ur technology so again i am sure uh, you would have read uh, or studied uh, the various types of recovery that we define in the industry uh, one is called primary recovery which is nothing but your uh, recovery on natural depletion or natural energy of the reservoir and also including artificial lift so this this comes under primary recovery then you have secondary recovery which is basically uh, either water flood or any kind of gas injection and this is nothing but pressure maintenance and improving your sweep and the third is the tertiary recovery which is either some kind of miscible gas flood or some chemical eor or thermal eor and this this eor and secondary recovery together is termed as improved oil recovery so that's why i i i uh, intentionally wrote ior oblique eor so people do confuse eor 
with uh, i mean uh, they are two different things no actually eor is a subset of ior so within ior again uh, i mean you can do lots of thing uh, in terms of secondary recovery water flood gas flood you can do some production enhancement in terms of optimizing your artificial lift stimulation um, upgrading facilities then uh, basically we will be focusing today mostly on eor so which is nothing three categories gas eor chemical eor and thermal eor so with uh, so in terms of uh, natural depletion what you do you i mean typically you have this oil zone in the middle with a gas cap and uh, aquifer at the bottom and then you drill wells in your oil zone and you produce it either on artificial lift or self energy and whatever is your recovery till till the well flows that's called nat uh, natural uh, depletion recovery right then uh, you implement in this example like we are talking about water injection what we do we inject uh, we drill few wells within the water leg or aquifer and inject water and then this water displaces your oil up dip and you uh, here you can see the location of the producer well it is in the middle of the oil leg whereas here you are you have uh, wells located also up dip because you expect this water to sweep oil up dip and then you get produce and that's why you achieve higher and higher residual oil saturation and higher uh, higher oil recovery so uh, before we get into eor methods uh, we need to focus first on how do we screen which eor methodology shall we uh, adopt and how do we select the right eor technology to be implemented in the reservoir so there are various uh, workflows so typically in industry what we follow is there is a tabor and martin criteria which i will uh, show you uh, in the next slide which basically gives you uh, uh, which technology to be implemented based on three uh, parameters, uh, which is basically reservoir depth, viscosity of oil, and your reservoir permeability. These are three parameters which basically governs or give you some guidance on which your technology to be implemented. We also have few softwares uh, available which you can use for the same, uh, same uh, screening. And once you have screened the, let's say, post screening, you dis, uh, we find that, OK, we can implement three or four uh, EOR technology. Then what you do? You do uh, some lab experiments. And then you quantify what is the possible incremental oil recovery by those proposed EOR technology. And then we do numerical simulation to forecast the oil production. And then we do our economic analysis. And then based on the economic analysis, which gives us best uh, highest NPV, we select the appropriate EOS uh, scheme. So as I said, uh, this is a matrix for, uh, given by Tabor and Martin, which, which uh, basically gives you how you decide on various EOR methods based on three parameters. So this table is for depth. So what it says is uh, the three EOR technology that we talked, gas EOR, chemical EOR, and thermal EOR. So basically, for depth less than up to 6,000 feet, I would say, you can go for gas EOR. Beyond 6,000 feet, probably gas EOR would be, I mean, it is possible, but the expenses and obviously the injection pressure that is required to inject gas at a depth more than 6,000 feet is too high, and that requires higher compression and hence higher cost. So ideally, for depth less than 6,000 feet, you go for gas EOR. Then between 8,000 and 10,000 feet, you go for chemical EOR. And uh, thermal EOR is very shallow. So less than 2,000 feet or 3,000 feet, you can go for uh, thermal EOR. That is the criteria based on depth. Then comes the next criteria called viscosity. And viscosity, again, if I say up to 1 to 10 centipoise, you can go for gas EOR. But between 10 to 50, you can think of some uh, chemical EOR. And up to more than 100 or up to 1,000 centipoise, you can go for thermal EOR. 
Similarly, the next criteria is permeability. Again, uh, for gas, your permeability is not a constraint at all. Even more than one milli Darcy is good enough for gas EOR. But for chemical EOR, you require a permeability definitely more than 10 milli Darcy, but in the range of hundreds. So between 100 to 1000, you can uh, go for chemical EOR. And uh, for uh, thermal, it has to be more than 1000. So these are the, I mean, there are other various uh, factors, but mostly these are the three parameters, as I said, one is depth, then you have viscosity, and then permeability. These are the three things which will give you a guidance in terms of what are the possible EOR methods that you can uh, implement. And then once you have selected your uh, EOR methods, you go for, uh, as I said, first lab experiments, then you do numerical simulation, then you do uh, economic analysis and then you decide the best method that is, I mean, uh, gives you the highest uh, returns in terms of commercial uh, value. So now we come to various EOR methods, which which industry I'm, uh, I'm not getting into too much technical details because you I am sure in your course you will have, uh, I mean, those theory and basics. But I will just give you very high level industry uh, specific information. So first we will talk about gas EOR. So gas EOR when we say uh, first is your miscible gas flooding. So what we do is you for example you see this is your injector well. This is your producer well. So what we do we uh, on surface we inject gas uh, through injector and then try to displace uh, the oil and these are the various uh, I mean zones that are created between an injector and a producer so what it does once the gas contacts the oil so it reduces the oil viscosity and hence it increases your sweep efficiency and oil production rate and because of swelling you have residual oil saturation reduced and hence your recovery is higher so again, uh, you will hear these two terms more often. One is your mobility ratio or oil viscosity reduction or and second is your residual oil saturation decrease. So these two things has to be there uh, for any EOR method to be successful. So in this case, miscible gas flooding, what we do gas uh, contacts oil and because and it reduces your viscosity and then as you inject more and more gas, it causes swelling and hence reduces your oil saturation. And so you see, I mean, when you first inject gas, this is your uh, oil zone, which is, you can say, uh, uh, still not uh, affected by the injected gas. Then you have this oil bank where the gas is almost miscible with the oil, where you have all the oil viscosity and swelling occurring within this oil bank and third is your um, uh, your hydrocarbon and water zone so basically and then the fourth is your uh, dry water so this is the zone where a gas is basically following the oil bank and this is where your uh, two uh, number two is your where oil is uh, gas is mixed with oil and this is your dry water to push the uh, oil up to the producer obviously it has got limitations so what what are the limitations number one is for oil and gas to achieve miscibility you need a minimum miscibility pressure so this mmp is has to be uh, lower than your reservoir pressure if your reservoir pressure is lower than mmp then you cannot achieve miscibility so your reservoir pressure has to be uh, uh, lower than your mmp if MMP is, uh, sorry, uh, your reservoir pressure has to be more than MMP. Uh, so uh, so uh, it, as long as it is lower than MMP, you cannot achieve miscibility. And again, as I uh, told you, uh, mobility ratio, I uh, explained you in previous slide. So in this case, uh, because gas is a very low viscosity uh, as compared to oil, so the viscosity ratio is more than one and hence uh, you will have uh, gas fingering through the reservoir so that will affect your sweep efficiency so again so these are some of the limitation of gas EOR. 
so in order to control this uh, fingering and uh, unfavorable mobility ratio there is another technology which is being implemented nowadays is called water alternate gas or wag you might have heard about it so what we do it is just a, uh, so what we do we uh, wag injection involves injecting alternately gas and water into reservoir via same injector so what we do first we inject gas followed by we inject water for some time and we try to maintain this ratio of a reservoir volume of water to gas uh, in the reservoir and try to maintain a wag ratio of 1 so you can see initial slide you had four zones now you have more than four zones so what happens you have this hydrocarbon which is uh, i would say let's say untouched then you have this miscible zone where gas is uh, achieves miscibility with oil then uh, in this example it is co2 which is injected followed by water so you have one cycle of gas and another cycle of water followed by another cycle of gas and then water so that is how you maintain so what it does so water basically uh, being uh, more viscous as compared to gas or oil it 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 controls the viscosity ratio okay mobility ratio what we call so because uh, water is more viscous so your mobility ratio is now controlled and uh, i mean closer to 1 and hence this fingering of gas through the reservoir is controlled so basically uh, gas injection reduce and again gas injection reduces residual oil saturation and water injection improves mobility ratio so that is the benefit of uh, injecting water along and uh, not along with but alternate gas so first you inject gas then you inject water to control the mobility again it has got limitation um what we have talked about is miscible uh, when the gas is mixed uh, achieves miscibility with oil but in terms uh, when you have we don't have miscibility uh, being achieved then uh, you have an issue in terms of high recovery again application of wag require high volume of gas and gas flow develops preferential paths that finger through unswept zones so these challenges remain but yes again uh, um water alternate gas will definitely give you a uh, higher recovery as compared to pure immiscible gas flooding so this was on gas ur then comes your polymer flood so uh, now we are moving into chemical ur i think uh, we have a very uh, i mean almost half way so i would uh, uh, try to be faster and give you uh, more case studies come to the case studies as quickly as possible so okay so first we talk about chemical eor which is uh, so polymer flooding is a form of water flooding basically uh, you mix uh, polymer powder with water and you make a mother solution and then uh, you inject that uh, solution into the reservoir so addition of polymer basically increases the viscosity of water and hence it reduces the mobility ratio and Uh, closer to one, and hence improves your uh, sweep efficiency and recovery. That is the whole mechanism of what polymer flooding. Again, in terms so, in if you look at here, I mean, again you have this uh, oil zone, then you have this polymer, which is basically uh, uh, improves the sweep and very little fingering of water. and then this dry water to push the oil bank towards the surface that is how uh, the mechanism works so in terms of limitation uh, high viscosity polymer solution may be uh, highly expensive then again clay content in the formation i mean higher the clay content uh, your polymer degrades and it gets absorbed on the rock so as i said rock fluid interaction is very important so if you have very high clay content then your polymer adsorption uh, within reservoir rock is high and, and hence your recoveries will be slightly lower start polymer flood before produced water cut is too high to avoid uh, i mean uh, and then increased polymer solution viscosity results in lower well injectivity because polymer because they are uh, heavy and viscous solution so obviously when you try to inject through well 
uh, injectivity is reduced these are some of the challenges we face in the industry but again you do lots of well stimulation to to improve the injectivity then there are various types of polymers one is called polyacrylamide and polysaccharide generally uh, i mean depending on uh, what you uh, basically uh, whether you want polyacrylamide or uh, polysaccharide uh, i mean uh, these polymers either uh, need to be thermally stable or they they basically uh, lose viscosity as as we inject it at high velocity which is called shear degradation so depending on situation you can go for either but most uh, most uh, most of the scenarios we go for polyacrylamide polymers uh, in industry then the next technology is called uh, asp uh, where obviously uh, so this is let's say this is your injector well so uh, asp is nothing but a combination of alkali surfactant and polymer solution so polymer not only uh, it it gives you uh, Uh, favorable mobility ratio but uh, it does not uh, reduce the residual oil saturation so if you want to reduce the residual oil saturation you have to uh, include uh, a surfactant basically which which reduces the interfacial tension and hence uh, reduction in sor and what alkali does basically <clears throat> alkali uh, is a solution which basically uh, uh, has the capability of generating in situ surfactant within reservoir so alkali has this capability that depending on reservoir salinity and acid content it can generate in situ surfactant so basically alkali helps uh, generate more and more surfactant within reservoir and hence you can reduce the sor to a greater extent and increase your uh, recovery factor so again nothing i mean this is your oil bank followed by your asp and then you inject at the end of asp you inject polymer at the end of polymer you again inject water so this is how the asp flood mechanism works then comes your uh, thermal method uh, so the thermal methods uh, is basically steam flooding uh, where uh, you inject steam through through injector well and then uh, because of the heat generated you reduce the viscosity of the reservoir fluid and hence it becomes more mobile and you uh, improve your recovery factor so there are th two methods basically another method is called cyclic steam injection or huff and puff where what we do uh, instead of having a injector and producer pair you have just one well so you first uh, inject steam <clears throat> and then you soak the steam and produce the oil from the same well so you basically use just one well for injection as well as production whereas in steam flooding you need to have a injector well and a production well and then comes your in situ combustion where uh, basically what you do is there is one electric heater which you place just near to the perforation in the injector well and you heat up the i mean increase the temperature of the near well bore area and then once your temperature reaches your ignition temperature then you inject air from the surface which which creates combustion and that combustion front uh, moves within reservoir and as it moves again it heats up the oil zone and reduces the viscosity and hence increases your oil rate and recovery so this is uh, in a nutshell uh, the overview of your thermal eor so now we move into some case study which which i got an opportunity to work uh, in any any questions so far or shall we move into the uh, real life case studies uh, so you can move okay so first we will talk about polymer and asp uh, uh, which uh, we did in uh, one of the fields uh, in india um, it's called mangla uh, when i was in kane so basically to give you before we get into full field implementation uh, any your technology needs some pilot test so for, uh, in this case we had this uh, five spot pattern 
that was decided to do the pilot. So we had these four injector wells drilled and then one producer well in the middle. And then there are three wells which were drilled as an observation well, where you will acquire some data to, to see how the saturation within this pilot area has changed over a period of time when you do either polymer or ASP pilot. So what is the sequence? So first what we do is you do a base water flood. So you will uh, uh, do a baseline for what is the recovery within this pilot area under water flood. Then you do a polymer, uh, polymer flood. Then you do uh, ASP flood. Then again you do go back and do polymer and then again you do water flood and that's where you will end up your pilot. So ob obviously the, there uh, were certain objectives. So, so one of the objective was to demonstrate that incremental oil can be produced and uh, we need to quantify the difference between polymer and ASP performance. Then define injectivity of viscous solutions, gather operational experience and provide data to allow technical and economic calculation. <clears throat> so uh, these are some of the results of the lab uh, uh, laboratory analysis. Uh, so the first one that you can see on the top. So you do a core flood. Uh, again, as I said, uh, based on the sequence, first we did water flood. So first we use the produced water flood, uh, produced water and uh, flood the core. Then we used our reservoir, uh, different source, which is called Thumbly water, then different concentration of polymers, 500 ppm, 1000 ppm, 1500 ppm. And you can see as we get into more and more polymer uh, concentration, our oil saturation, remaining oil saturation started going down. Then you bring in alkali, then you bring in alkali plus surfactant, then you bring in alkali surfactant and polymer again different uh, concentration and you can see uh, initial saturation with no uh, no water flood you were still at 90 percent oil and at the end of asp you come down to almost 15 percent residual oil saturation so you can say i mean uh, not uh, in absolute fashion but yes on a volumetric fashion you can say that you could uh, reduce the residual oil saturation from 90% initial to 92, almost 15%. So there was an incremental recovery of 75% uh, at the end um, within that core. But yes, when you do a fulfilled implementation, you should not expect uh, this much reduction, obviously, because of the heterogeneities that are present. Then this is the IFT measurement again. Uh, this is your shear stability. What it is? Shear stability is nothing but uh, you see how the viscosity of the polymer changes uh, with with the shear rate. So as you increase uh, the shear rate or uh, shear rate is nothing but indirectly representation of your injection volume, injection rate. So as you increase the injection rate, your viscosity will uh, go down. Apparent viscosity will go down. So what it says is as you increase your shear rate, you can see your viscosity is down by almost 10 to 11 percent then these are uh, your uh, polymer flood and ASP flood results which talks about how under polymer so you started off with water so your oil cut goes down so oil cut goes down means water cut goes up and when you started your polymer again your oil cut goes up so this is your incremental oil due to polymer similarly ASP so at the end of the polymer, you uh, had very little oil cut, almost 1% or maybe 2-3%. You introduced ASP and again your oil cut increased to almost 30-40% and then maintained for a quite a good number of time and then again goes down. So this is your incremental oil due to ASP at the uh, core level. And this also is your uh, thermal stability of the polymer. Uh, which which we carry out in lab so it says that your viscosity uh, changes with time at a certain uh, in the reservoir condition so what it says is this particular uh, polymer 
uh, we had a reduction in permeability uh, per viscosity from 19 centipoise to almost 15 centipoise within 40 days and this particular polymer it started off at lower viscosity but it is stays there so you have to have a polymer which is more thermally stable and at the desired viscosity so these are some of the uh, lab analysis which was carried out to screen various types of chemicals in for i mean in terms of polymer or asp which we need to uh, 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 use for 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 either polymer flood or asp flood then again uh, for polymer these are some of other experiments like how the apparent viscosity changes with polymer concentration so i mean there were eight different polymers that were evaluated and you can see um, i mean uh, how the viscosity so our desired range um, for for achieving a mobility ratio close to one we needed to be in this range between 2000 to 2500 ppm which would have given us a viscosity ratio of one so all the uh, various polymers that you see i mean they they are pretty much similar but if you look at this experiment which is how the viscosity changes with shear rate uh, again you can see we needed a polymer which uh, which is having very least degradation in terms of viscosity so uh, i mean uh, again based on this and then the third was thermal stability so how the various um, polymer solutions they they show minimum thermal degradation so these three parameters uh, basically helps us decide the polymer that needs to be used for polymer flood. Then this is uh, ASP experiment where basically you, uh, I mean, use microemulsion solution, which is a mixture of uh, water and oil mixed with surfactant and alkali. Uh, and then we measure one uh, parameter called solubilization ratio. And this solubilization ratio should be more than 10. Uh, and also, um, there are basically three types of uh, microemulsion. So once you achieve this type three microemulsion, that is the ideal candidate for your ASP implementation. And what is this type three uh, microemulsion is when uh, you have both. I mean, you can see these are various uh, uh, tubes, test tubes we call or phase tubes where we have this mixture of water oil mixed with surfactant and alkali so you have different concentration of alkali in diff on in in all the tubes basically it starts with zero percent alkali then 0 0.5 0 0.75 so you have increasing uh, concentration of uh, alkali in all the test tubes but same uh, um, surfactant and polymer solution and you can see here you have just two separate phase this black one and this brown one and here you have three separate phases this black then brown and then uh, uh, light light brown you can say so where you have three separate phases they are called type 3 microemulsion and uh, basically what we call it oil and water are both solubilized by the surfactant so this this so we look for this type 3 microemulsion being formed and whatever is the uh, uh, alkali concentration that we call it as optimum salinity for for the surfactant so we don't go for either type 1 or type 2 but we go for type 3 so wherever um, we achieve this type 3 microemulsion we select that alkali and surfactant uh, for for the asp implementation so once we select that, then we went for the pilot uh, implementation. And then you can see uh, your pilot performance. So I mean, uh, this is how your green line is your oil rate. So you started off with 1000 barrels of oil and no water and during water flood. And it came down up to less than 200 barrels. And you have more and more water coming in. But this is the time when you started your polymer and you started seeing more and more oil and water getting down. And this is because polymer being, as I said, um, 
viscous uh, viscous component it uh, improves your mobility ratio and improves the sweep as a result you produce more and more oil and less and water cut starts going down and then after some time again you have water breakthrough happening so this is what you can call as incremental due to uh, polymer and then this is uh, basically uh, the injectivity in all the four injector wells that we had so i mean how the thp changed with time and these are your uh, the three wells that we talked about in terms of observation well so we take time lapsed uh, rst which which says how your saturation has changed over time and you will start seeing saturation resaturation of oil and again desaturation so this tells you that your sweep is improving with implementation of polymer so based on those data when you do a proper modeling what we see is you have a incremental oil recovery of around 11% uh, due to polymer flat over water flat and this is again once you have the uh, polymer pilot then we also went for a asp pilot and you can see when we started asp our oil rate was close to 100 barrels in the pilot area and once we started the asp slowly the water started going up and water uh, and the liquid rate uh, was stable and this blue line is your uh, water cut basically you can see the water dropped from almost 90% to less than 20% and remain there for a long time and then again you have what uh, water breakthrough and then oil going down so again this shows you you have swept more uh, i mean uh, more of your residual oil or more of your bypassed oil in the reservoir and incremental recovery due to asp so in terms of full field implementation what we did uh, the pilot Uh, the water flood was on a nine spot pattern so what we say is you had an injector water injector in the middle and then eight producers uh, which was i mean so it's called a inverted nine spot pattern injection and during polymer and esp we converted this nine spot into five spot where we have now four injectors and a producer in the middle so you drill one uh, four wells here 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 every pattern we introduced four more wells and they were converted into injector and this injector was converted into producer so we converted a nine spot pattern into a five spot pattern so you reduce the well spacing and uh, and implemented polymer followed by asp and improved the sweep and in, uh, incremental oil then and that was a uh, a case study based on uh, polymer nasp now i will just touch upon the pilot uh, which we designed i am not sure if the execution has happened because i am no more <clears throat> there in the company but there was a plan to do this css pilot which is nothing but cyclic steam stimulation so uh, this was a field uh, which was very viscous almost 1000 centipoise or 700 to 1000 centipoise oil and uh, we decided to do a css pilot so these are the two wells that we decided to drill and uh, the plan was to first we produce this these wells uh, on cold production means just natural depletion for 15 days and then we will inject uh, steam uh, 800 to 1000 barrels per day and then we inject it for 20 days and then we soak the shocking time for 5 to 10 days and again produce back for 10 to 11 months that was the whole css pilot uh, <clears throat> so based on numerical and an analytical uh, model uh, so basically two ways we uh, modeled this uh, one was the numerical and other was the analytical model both the model had more or less uh, similar uh, outcome but uh, yes uh, numerical models are more reliable because they take care of all the reservoir heterogeneity whereas analytical model they are just some uh, i mean very simple uh, analogy or some simple method methodology which does not take care of the reservoir heterogeneities but more or less at the end of the day 
both the models were showing some incremental oil which was making some commercial uh, returns for the company and this is the plan we decided but i am not sure if this has actually been executed till date or not but yes just for your information uh, we were involved with this pilot design so this is just a result so which which says is i mean uh, this is your individual cycles that you see so peak oil rate achieved was 500 barrels uh, this is this this y axis secondary y axis and decreases rapidly to less than 150 barrels and then continues till 10 barrels because 10 barrels was your commercial limit so this is the benefit of css so a well which has a capacity to produce 10 to 100 barrels can produce up to 500 barrels uh, uh, and this is this one cycle is 11 months so every 11 month you have to go inject steam for 10 to 15 days soak it for 5 to 10 days and then again produce for 10 to 11 months that is why it is called huff and puff method and then this is another uh, technology which i am currently working on here in malaysia which is called gas wag which is nothing but gravity assisted simultaneous water and gas injection what uh, what we do here is it's a very matured field uh, you already have achieved 45 to 50 percent recovery factor but still as you say every field has got lots of uh, residual oil saturation as well as bypassed oil so this is a uh, this is a uh, me uh, mechanism where we, uh, we in i mean uh, inject water in the crystal area and uh, inject gas in the aquifer so basically what you see in a conventional way you inject gas at the crest and inject water at the aquifer but in this process it's the other way around you inject water at the crest and gas at the bottom or aquifer and what it does because of gravity the gas that you inject will move up right and the water that you inject at the top will move down because of their gravity segregation and when the water moves down and gas moves up in that process they reduce the residual oil saturation to gas and hence improves your uh, oil recovery so you have this in a producer you have this injector in the water leg and water injector at the crest and they basically sweep the bypassed and residual oil and get it produced through the middle producer so this is this is overall uh, mechanism uh, for gas vac so we are in the process of implementing this uh, all the modeling and lab analysis has been done and uh, very soon we will start this uh, i mean production through this project so I think uh, this is all I have for today uh, and uh, I'm open to some uh, Q&A if you guys have and uh, yeah, so thank you. Uh, thank you sir for such a wonderful lecture. I am sure everyone has gained knowledge from this. The knowledge you have provided us today will be of great help for us towards our journey of becoming a petroleum engineer. So now moving on to the Q&A session, I request all the attendees to write their question in the chat box so that I can ask it on behalf of them. So what are the three, what are the three types of emulsions observed and why do we choose the third type? So, okay, as I said, um, three types are i mean uh, they are called type 1 type 2 and type 3 so uh, they are micro emulsions not emulsion just to correct and the micro emulsion is basically a mixture of minimum three components or three phases so in this case it is oil water and surfactant and uh, based on uh, uh, there is one uh, uh, what we call uh, winsor so he basically uh, devised these uh, type 1 type uh, winsor classification so type 1, type 2 and type 3. So basically, as I said, uh, type 3, because uh, when you implement ASP, you are dealing with reservoir oil, water and surfactant, right? So you need a type 3.
city where you have surfactant as well as water and oil they so your oil and water there has to be uh, uh, they need to be solubilized by this surfactant mixture if uh, so that can be achieved only uh, during type 3 and that is why uh, based on the lab studies uh, the uh, you will go for type 3 uh, microemulsion uh, so so yeah that's that's my uh, response here yeah. So, so the second question is, what is the best time to start an EOR project? And the, the best time is as soon as possible. Uh, but uh, again, having said that, uh, again, we need to do a thorough screening and also a proper lab analysis uh, to, to implement any EOR project. Like, uh, in case of Mangala, if you see uh, the polymer was uh, implemented uh, after two years of water flood. But from day one, it was clear that this is the best approach to go for. Otherwise, if you go through the literatures, they will tell you to implement EOR at the uh, end of your water flood. But we started the polymer at the beginning of the field life. So because we had done a thorough screening uh, at the beginning and also done all the right lab experiments, which which gave us this confidence to go ahead with the UR. Uh, sir, uh, sir, I have a question. Yeah. Sir, uh, how does uh, how does this uh, choosing the spot patterns, like the five spot or seven spot or the inverted ones, affect the uh, recovery of the Right. So, uh, correct. So uh, again, the spot uh, spot patterns will uh, decide on your uh, if you let say if reservoir is too heterogeneous, you have too many variation in the reservoir properties, then it will require closely spaced pattern. Okay. But if your reservoir is homogeneous, then you don't need uh, too many wells to be drilled. Right. You can uh, you can achieve higher recovery with lower number of wells but if you again so it all depends on your reservoir properties and your reservoir heterogeneity like within mangala we had two types of uh, reservoirs uh, one was a shallower one where we had uh, lower net to gross so that's why we went for a pattern development and when we implemented water flood we started off with a bigger pattern bigger spacing because no company wants to spend too much money upfront right so we started off with a nine spot, which where you drill more number of uh, less number of wells, and then when we did a thorough lab experiment and uh, all the simulation studies, then we went for a closely spaced five spot pattern uh, to improve our sweep and also our uh, overall recovery. But we had a deeper reservoir within Mangala, which was called Lower Fatehgarh, where the properties were too good. Malab, uh, permeability was more than. Uh, close to 10 Darcy's. Um, Netto gross was close to 90-95%. So there we don't need any pattern uh, development. So we had injectors drilled at the peripheral or the near the count, uh, uh, contact and all the producers were horizontal wells at the top of the reservoir and uh, we could uh, sweep the reservoir very well. So it all depends on your reservoir properties and heterogeneity. Uh, one more question sir. Sir, when we are doing the pilot testing with the various polymers, so uh, yeah. the polymers do, do get absorbed on the solid surfaces of the sand grains in the uh, pores. So when we are testing with uh, multiple yeah. polymers, so does the interaction between the various polymers also affect the recovery efficiency with, uh, which we are experiencing? Definitely, definitely it affects. And that is why uh, you need to do these uh, rock fluid and fluid fluid analysis to, to see uh, uh, whether your polymer is thermally stable and uh, what is the degree of adsorption uh, based on the lab experiments. And that's how you decide the best possible polymer solution, which will have uh, lesser adsorption. Uh, and in, I mean, in industry term, it is called as residual res resistance factor. The one which is having uh, lower residual resistance factor is more desirable. So I think that's it with the questions.
anything else about yourself so uh, we consider what ourselves process? extremely what sir one more question one more question so the last process that we have discussed uh, with the reference we are working uh, currently the uh, alternating gas induction the dielectric back process gas so is it a, uh, is it a new process alternating gas that something are doing or it, it, it is applicable with other areas in the world Been, sorry uh, your voice is breaking uh, raj you can uh, be more sir uh, sir uh, am i am i audible sir yes sir i was asking that the gas uh, the gas vac process that you have discussed at the last uh, mm -hmm. is it a new process just uh, being done at petronas or it has been done in past as well in various other no it is i mean as per my information it is the first project in the entire uh, petroleum industry uh where petronas is uh, working on it yeah you won't find any paper or anything uh, on this yes sir because it was quite new to see yes. gas being injected in the top uh, in the yes. bottom of the reservoir right right, right. yes sir. thank you sir so that's it for the questions so we consider ourselves extremely fortunate uh, to have had the opportunity to speak with you today the knowledge you shared with us about enhanced oil recovery at such an early stage of our engineering journey was truly uh, eye opening so we all thank you for your assistance once more uh, we will all work hard and follow the principles and advice you gave us today i hope every student had a good time and learned something new today thank you for attending today's meeting sir we will certainly follow what you said thank you thank you for this opportunity yeah. and uh, all the very best to all of you for your bright future and i would request you feel free to contact me uh, whenever you have any uh, information required or any support required and i will do my best uh, to support you yeah so before coming to an end of this extremely informative webinar if you would like to speak few words about how was your experience about today's webinar as i said i mean uh, ism has uh, got a very special place in my heart right so uh, anyone from ism i mean uh, or any any other forum or any other uh, i mean i am always there uh, if i get uh, if i have the time right so uh, it was really wonderful interacting with all of you and uh, i hope to be in touch with all of you in future and i am sure industry is very small so we might meet at some place or some event or some company uh, working together and uh, all the very best to all of you yeah thank thank you sir yeah and please convey my regards to faculty members uh, i'm not sure who all are there but uh, i i have been uh, i mean uh, professor t kumar uh, ak pathak vp sama uh ajay mandal i mean uh, uh, please convey my regards to all of them if they are there yeah yes sir yes sir yes uh, actually sir the faculty advisor of the sc chapter professor nikhil pan moresh uh, has asked that he couldn't attend this so we are bit sorry that no but he uh, has thankfully uh, put his note thank you for giving this webinar in this time thank you thank you Thank you so much. It was a pleasure to have you today, and we would want to connect with you in the future. Yeah, sure. for more such events. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Bye. Have a good day. Bye, sir. Thank you, sir.